Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, always known as Forum BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. And today I'm going to be taking a look at the G.I. Joe's hovercraft, the 1984 Killer Whale, Warrior Hovering Assault Launching Envoy, and its pilot, Cutter. Now Cutter makes his first appearance in the Old Mova comic run of G.I. Joe in issue number 25. But the Killer Whale itself does make its first appearance until a bit later in issue 28. However, cartoon-wise, in the 1984 Sunbow animated five-part miniseries, The Revenge of Cobra, it's the Killer Whale that makes its first appearance in Part 1, but Cutter does make his first appearance until Part 3. Now, the Killer Whale has actually remained one of my top 10 favorite G.I. Joe vehicles uh, almost 20 years straight. And that's including all the new vehicles that I've actually been buying recently just to add to my collection and falling in love with. And that says quite a lot about the design of this particular vehicle. And I'm sure it's a lot of other people's top tens as well, which is why I wanted to redo this video. Obviously, I've done my review of the Killer Whale many, many years ago, almost eight years ago at the beginning of my channel. But I think now is a perfect time to do uh, an update video with modern equipment. The Killer Whale, as most collectors will actually just refer to it as the Whale, is a whopping 18 and a half inches long and 10 inches wide. It's a massive, massive toy. And it's not incorrect to call this thing almost as much of a vehicle as it is a playset. And here is a three and three quarter inch figure just to show you the scale of this thing. The whale has two forward-facing cannons, one on either side. As you can see, all they do is elevate. Above that, we have two turreted machine guns. The turrets themselves swivel around, and the machine guns can pivot up and down, although not really that high up, to be honest. The machine guns themselves have little handholds here joysticks, but they're really small. However, it's a good thing that they're small because then they don't snap off and they don't snap the thumbs of the action figures. The turrets themselves are really deep so you can get a figure well in there. Behind that and to either side of the crow's nest cockpit are two box missile launchers with four missiles each, meaning that there are eight of these missiles. As you can see, they rotate quite well, but elevating and depressing them is a little bit hard to do. The uh, that arm that this thing is pivoting on is a bit fragile, and I don't really want to stress it. And this is what one of the missiles looks like. And on the right side only... All the way at the back, we have the depth charge launcher with six depth charges. The depth charges themselves are just the simple barrel type. However, you'll notice that I only have five loaded up because that's all that fits on the ramp. And this is a real working depth charge launcher. You have a lever here, and when you pull it up, one launches out, and the rest gravity falls into the next loading chamber. Well, I suppose you could just pretend that this is an automatic or computer run mechanism. The ledge there is just perfect for a GI Joe to sit there and manually operate it themselves. And if you're wondering about the extra depth charge, there's plenty of storage spaces inside the craft for the extra barrel. And speaking of storage, the whale has a ton of it by an opening front ramp. You just have to move the guns out of the way and open this cabin door all the way up so that you can open the front ramp. While the loading ramp does look like it's at a fairly good angle to load up vehicles like a small motorcycle or something like that, the cabin is really only meant for personnel. When folded up, the ramp actually covers up this uh, large flat area, which is, I guess, good for display or stuff, something like that, but it's really not very good for anything else. 
Behind that, however, is the deep cabin area where you're supposed to put your figures in. And while it may be a little bit hard to see, there's actually eight foot pegs in there. Although two are meant for one figure each, the way they're arranged. So it's really only meant for four, but honestly, you can cram a whole bunch of other figures, probably up to about eight figures in there fairly comfortably. And while the two um, arrangement of the foot pegs are meant for you to have the figures facing forward, I sometimes have them face them sideways just so that they can look out the side windows as well. There's also a little shelf up there, which is actually open to the turreted cannons up above. So when you have figures in there, you can actually see their legs. Just below the rocket launchers are removable panels to show engine detail. There's one on each side. I find it easiest to lift from the bottom portion and then pull outwards. And as you can see, the engine detail is mirrored from the other side, as they should be as these are supposed to represent the engines which power the shafts for the fans. However, there's one very interesting thing is that the doors for those engine covers are mirrored themselves. So there is a left and right version of these. I do apologize for the awkward angle, but it is fairly difficult to film the inside of the crow's nest cockpit because it is just so kind of deep and narrow. But as you can see, there are Four foot pegs here meant really only for two figures, but you can actually fit a third figure actually rather comfortably in here. A figure when using those foot pegs just barely makes it over the crow's nest, which is perfectly fine for the tiny little windshield. And this is the way that I and many other collectors actually tend to display their cutter figure or any other figure that they want in the crow's nest cockpit here. Just that he's a little bit more visible in displays. I'm just using the dashboard as a platform. The whale has working directional vanes, both horizontal, like these ones, and vertical, like these ones. As you can see, they're attached at the bottom just so that they can move in tandem. But more than that, it has working rotor fan blades. And that's what this big white button on the back here is. Unfortunately, I tend to think of it as a little bit obnoxious on an otherwise very realistic looking toy. But I have heard that some people are saying that it kind of looks like a radar dish. I don't know, it's a, it's a nice excuse, but I don't really see it. But when you push it down, it rotates the uh, fan blades rather nicely, I might add. I just removed the entire mechanism out. It's actually a fairly easy thing to do because it comes out in one big chunk like this. And as you can see, this is what the mechanism looks like inside. And it's actually completely bare like this. So if any of these gears are out of whack, it's actually fairly easy just to get in there with maybe a screwdriver or something and put them back into proper alignment. Underneath the whale, we have four of these omnidirectional wheels, kind of like office chair wheels. It's, uh, fair, it's actually fairly hard for me to get this vehicle to roll in a straight line, simply because each one of these wheels wants to go in a completely different direction. But I understand why they went and did this. It's to give the whole illusion of the hovercraft floating in any direction that it could possibly want to go in. And it also has this very odd, very suspicious bottom storage area. So you push this tab forward and lift this whole thing out. And what you're left with is kind of a shallow storage area, which seems to be just large enough for four C-sized batteries. Now I'm guessing that at one point uh, this would have been a battery compartment and that the rotor fans would have been battery operated but that might have been a bit too expensive at retail. So they went and took that out and made their own little clockwork mechanism instead. On the left side rear of the whale, we have the storage spot for the surveillance cycle. This is a tiny little included cycle with this thing. And it has a movable front fork and wheel. And here's what a figure looks like riding this thing. It's not going to be replacing your Ram or Silver Mirage anytime soon, let me tell you.
The Whale's surveillance cycle is based on the early 1980s Honda Moto Compo. The G.I. Joe toy even has a Moto sticker where the real cycle would have its logo. The idea for this circus chimp sized two-wheeler was that anybody could fold, lift and pop it into the back slot of a Honda City hatchback. I remember seeing it on the 1994 Japanese anime You're Under Arrest and thinking, hmm, that looks oddly familiar. The surveillance cycle has rather wide flat wheels so you would think that it would actually be fairly planted without the need of a kickstand but it's still kind of wobbly especially when it weighs less than the figure that you're putting on it. However the track that this thing goes on does have divots for the wheels and I must say it actually holds in there really well and the final feature of the whale is the launching recon sled. You have to open this door first in order for this feature to work first though. So you just put your finger into that little hole and just lower the door. And you can see the recon sled inside. Then you push down on this button and there you go. The recon sled is some type of jet ski I'm supposing, although it doesn't have any detail at the back like a, a rotor or some type of jet exhaust, but I'm still guessing it is a watercraft. Despite the fact that it has wheels at the bottom, which I have to say are a little bit too effective at propelling this thing across the uh, flat surface on the floor. This is, I suppose, the best way to actually pose a figure actually riding in the recon sled. With the head just sort of poking out through that indentation in the windshield, which kind of seems to defeat the purpose, but you know, whatever. You can see those white prongs are actually what pushes up against the back of the recon sled in order to push it forward. But there's also two walls on either side of this thing, so you have to be really straight when you're putting, pushing this thing in so it lines up and actually connects. You'll hear it click and of course you'll see the button pop up so it's ready to be pushed again. The original idea behind the launch switch was that you push the button and the force of the recon sled coming out actually pushed the door open, which is why early versions of this toy actually do not have this finger groove in here or even slats in order to help lock this thing down. It was actually just supposed to kind of crash open. And I think they abandoned that idea because if you really uh, stress this door, it'll actually just crack right off. A rival to the whale on the Cobra side would be the 1988 Bug. It could transition from the water to the land and back again. Even though it wasn't a hovercraft, it was a wheeled submarine. And just like the whale, it had tiny little extra vehicles. Another example would be the 1990 Cobra Hammerhead. Another vehicle which was basically just a tracked submarine which had multiple little vehicles which could be uh, attached and stored onto the vehicle. Unfortunately, there is no update to the whale. Even though there was a 1989 Toys R Us exclusive Night Force version, Hasbro never actually reused the mold or had anything very fairly similar to this in its function. Rather unfortunate because in 1995, had the vintage line continued for one more year, we would have gotten a reuse of this mold. Cutter, the G.I. Joe's only Coast Guardsman in the entire line, has no accessories whatsoever, making him very easy to complete on the aftermarket, and he's actually fairly cheap as well. His codename is actually based on a class of vessel that Coast Guardsmen actually use. Very ironic, seeing as he's a hovercraft pilot. Before I go on with the figure, I'd just like to make note of the file card. Now normally I let you, the viewer, read the file card by yourself, but there are a few things that I want to point out, which is very interesting. The first thing is that there are three jokes in the file card. The first being his name, Stone, Skip A, or Skip a Stone. Basically alluding to skipping a stone across a body of water. The second is his secondary military specialty, being a coach for a women's swimming team. Now, I don't know how he becomes a male coach to a women's swim team, but you know, sure, whatever. But then he's also a Coast Guardsman at a Navy Academy. I'm not sure how that works either. 
And then lastly, there's his birthplace, Kansas, which means that he was, he was actually born in the middle of the United States, as far from each of the coasts of the United States as possible. One very odd thing that I did notice, however, is that his serial number starts with RA, which is usually reserved for the army and not any other service. In Order of Battle number one, a comic book released in 1987, you'll see that he has a completely different serial number. But then again, this thing actually states that he has no middle initial, which would then make his name Skip Stone, which doesn't sound quite as good. However, this does also state his prototype code names as well. I really like Cutter's practical outfit. Sure, he may not be the top end of what I like in a driver, but at least he looks like he's a driver. He looks, well, like a Coast Guardsman. With the blue shirt and the navy dungarees. And of course he's wearing a blaze orange life jacket. He's kind of plain, really. But then again, he kind of reminds me of a Fisher Price adventure person. And that's not really a bad comparison at all. One very interesting thing is the Boston Red Sox cap he's wearing on his head. If, and it's very strange because, well, you know, he's from Kansas and he's not from Boston or the New England area. One very interesting thing about the figure is that there are variations to his facial hair. As you can see, his entire facial hair is done in one color, but the back of his hair is actually done in another. That means that this was an early release figure where the paint masks were done with two different types of paint. However, later versions just used the same paint for the back of his hair and his face. Also, as you can see from my example, the blue shirt actually does go green after a while fairly easily. Uh, it should be as bright blue as this. As I've already used the Cobra Bug as an example of an opposite number to the whale, I guess an opposite number to Cutter here might be the Secto Viper from 1988 as well. However, if you want to get technical, a lot of people do consider the 1984 Copperhead to be his opposite number, not just because he is a aquatic driver, but because what he's driving, the Cobra 1984 Cobra Moccasin, is an air-driven vehicle, just like the Whale. As I've stated multiple times before, this thing has remained on my top 10 list of favorite G.I. Joe vehicles for almost 20 years. And that's because of two major things. The first is, of course, that I coveted this thing as a child. A childhood friend actually had one, and I was really impressed by it. And the second important reason is that, as an adult, I'm still impressed by this thing. I really love the look of it, all the military green, all the weapons, it's very aggressive looking. And of course, it has tons of features on here which actually work and are very practical to what this thing is supposed to do. Of course, it works as both a vehicle and of course as a display piece because of how many figures you can actually stuff in here. You're officially supposed to put nine figures in here, but like I said, all the portions where you're supposed to put figures in, there's actually way more room and you can put even more figures into those positions. Even the storage area on the bottom could be used for prisoners, I suppose. There were several variations of the whale. The easiest to spot are the ones with different recon sled doors. Some had horizontal slots like mine, and an equal amount had vertical slots. Harder to find are the doors with no slots at all. Not so easy to spot is a dashboard variant. Later versions had extra detail. Finally, there is a rare mail-in version made of a slightly richer green, probably foreign produced overstock, made available in 1993. Like I said, the whale is very utilitarian looking with its all dark army green. It has no fantasy elements in it. Even some G.I. Joe vehicles which are based on real world vehicles tend to have like a laser cannon or a jet or something like that or some oversized weapon. But this is very practical looking. It looks like this thing would exist in real life, but it's not based on a real world vehicle. It was probably influenced by the Navy PACV and Army ACVs of the 1960s. These were armed combat hovercrafts where previously hovercrafts in the military were employed only as ferries. 
I'll also include the Navy LCAC as a possible design influence. Despite being officially launched in 1986, since the decades old prototypes were no secret to the public, and the toy designers would have noticed the distinctive double ducted fans and forward loading ramp missing on the previous crafts. If there's one unfortunate negative I have to say about the whale is that it has the really bad choice of plastic used for the green portions. Almost the entire top end of this vehicle is this kind of light, very brittle plastic. I understand why they used it. It's to lighten the vehicle up so that it floats. Now, I don't really think that that was terribly necessary because it's really the bottom portion, the well, the flotation skirt on the hovercraft actually does what it's meant to do on the toy, as it would in reality. And the fact of the matter is, is that all it is is that the seam line along here is really well done on my example, which means that mine floats really well, no matter how much weight you would have put on top of this thing. So putting a brittle type of plastic on top so that things like the arms on the missile boxes and the veins and of course the front door are all very, almost always broken on, ex on loose examples of this thing. In three, two, one. It's actually rather uh, stable and um, stable and quite level as well. It displaces its own uh, its own weight in water, obviously. Uh, but when you add a figure, it um, well, it doesn't float. If you're looking for a whale on the aftermarket, it is actually a fairly expensive vehicle to find. If you're looking for one absolutely complete, there are tons of them on the aftermarket, let me be honest, but there aren't really a ton intact, simply because of the aforementioned green plastic, which is really made of a brittle type of plastic quality. Unfortunately, like I said, the arms for the missile box and the front door are often broken, but those actually can be found intact. Honestly, it's these rear veins which are most often broken. They're meant to be kind of moved around, but they really can't be. As you can see, mine still has a bit of glue on there because mine have actually gone undergone multiple repairs, despite the fact that I haven't really touched the rear fans all that much. This thing has been really just a display piece for the last 20 years, and even then, it still manages to break itself. Normally, I don't condone reproductions, but not only will I make an exception here, but I'll even spotlight the maker. These resin reproduction veins are pretty high quality, while I don't have any myself. I've seen them in person, and the fit is perfect. I even go so far as to recommend these over finding expensive and brittle originals that may break when inserting them.
little hand holds. And speaking of storage, the hover crop, the clip of the cap up. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.